Hello again. In this specific video, uh, among my teaching and research videos, I will be developing sort of a loose reflection and loose research on the philosophy of science, especially on the philosophy of social sciences. Uh, I will be using some readings. You will see which one will they be. I start with one of my preferred writers in the strictly speaking field of social sciences. Thus, I start with uh, Fernand Brodel, a French historian, and with his book entitled uh, Civilization and Capitalism. Give me one second to call his the PDF of his book into the video screen and we go. Okay, this is the front page. We extend it a little bit. I jump into the top left corner. I, actually, I think that in your case it would be the top right corner, but whatever, uh, of the screen. And here it comes. Huh? So, Civilization and Capitalism, 15th to 18th century, Fernand Braudel, and this is book number two, or part two of the book, The Wheels of Commerce. I quickly jump to the introduction, which I started to read in one of my uh, past videos. Okay. I read it again just to give you a, an idea of how I see the philosophy of science. How, so, so what did Fernand Braudel write? If I were to look for a simple image, I would say that the present volume takes us upstairs from the ground level of material life, the subject of the first volume of this book, and explores the upper stories, representing what I have called economic life before moving to the highest level of all, the action of capitalism. This metaphor of a house with several floors is a reasonable translation of the reality of the things we shall be considering, though it does rather strain their concrete meaning. Between material life, in the sense of an extremely elementary economy and economic life, the contact surfaces is not continuous, but takes the form of thousands of humble points of intersection, markets, stalls, shops. Each point marks a break. On one side is economic life with its commerce, its currencies, its nodal points and its superior equipment, great trading cities, stock exchanges and fairs. On the other, material life, the non-economy imprisoned within self-sufficiency. The economy begins at the fateful threshold of exchange value. Okay. From the point of view of the philosophy of science, from the point of view of the most elementary toolbox of social scientists, what Fernand Braudel writes here about is diversity. I look at social life and I see many apparently distinct or truly distinct phenomena. I try to understand them in their diversity. And here I jump to another author or philosopher I like, uh, to Laplace, the famous mathematician. So I respectfully kick Professor Braudel out of the video window and I also respectfully add Marquis de Laplace. Yes, he was a Marquis, a noble born. Let's see. Okay, cool. Perfect, we go. So this is a book entitled The Philosophical Essay on Probabilities. I sourced it from the Project Gutenberg depository. It was published in 1902, 
two, so more than 100 years ago. Yet, as you will see in the introduction, which I will bring up, uh, this book r resumes as a, an English translation the French lectures of Laplace delivered in the end or in the second half of the 18th century. So this particular uh, edition, this publication is more than one century after the thoughts presented here were presented for the first time to the public. So we go, introduction. This philosophical essay is the development of a lecture on probabilities which I delivered in 1795 to the normal schools whither I had been called by a decree of the National Convention as professor of mathematics with Lagrange. And I straightforwardly go uh, into a slightly further component uh, of that introduction, specifically this one. Given for one instant an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated and the respective situation of the beings who compose it, an intelligence sufficiently vast to submit this data to analysis, it would embrace in the same formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the lightest atom. For it nothing would be certain and future, as the past would be present to its eyes. The human mind offers, in the perfection which it has been able to give to astronomy, a feeble idea of this intelligence. Its discoveries in mechanics and geometry added to that of universal gravity have enabled it to comprehend in the same analytical expressions the past and future states of the system of the world. Applying the same method to some other objects of its knowledge, it has succeeded in referring to general laws observed, phenomena, and in foreseeing those which given circumstances ought to produce. All these efforts in the search for truth tend to lead it back continually to the vast intelligence which we have just mentioned, but from which it will always remain infinitely removed. This tendency, peculiar to the human race, is that which renders it superior to animals, and their progress in this respect distinguishes nations and ages and constitutes their true glory. Here we have two perspectives on any kind of phenomena studied by science. We have the perspective of that vast, perfect intelligence. So the, per the perspective of a scientist who looks at the subject matter of his research sort of from outside, with the, in an attempt to be perfectly impartial and perfectly objective. Yet, there is another perspective, especially in social sciences. In social sciences. If we want to understand how societies change, how cultures change, how markets change, it is useful to adopt another point of view, that of the human being who is inside the events, instead of that cold external point of view, because the actual social change is being performed, is being done and made by people who are inside the change, not outside of it. So if we, want to to, if we want to understand the mechanics of the change, we need to understand that balance or that constant shift between those two points of view. It is useful to understand that data, empirical data about societies and social change, which we can see and study as scientists, is just one point of view. It is, but this data represents change done and made under a completely different perspective of people who are inside the change. And now, as I am performing that little intellectual stunt, I will move to another writer. So, Marquis de Laplace 
you will be kind enough to move out of our window and I jump into the window with another piece of reading, a preferred piece of reading of mine. I, I will tell you like straight from the beginning. It is a book entitled Truth and Method. Written, here you have it. Truth and Method, written by Hans Georg Gadamer one of the most influential, I think, modern German philosophers. Uh, he seems to be like one of the most important philosophers in a stream of philosophy called hermeneutics, or the philosophy of human knowledge and uh, the philosophy of human culture. Hermeneutics are a, signed, um, are a kind of smart way at the frontier of ontology and epistemology and phenomenology and phenomenology i am sorry i lost the rhythm a, a little bit so here i jump straight forwardly to the forward by the author so i skip all the translate translators preface oh here we are. Here is the introduction by the author, by Hans-Georg Gadamer. And so we read, these studies are concerned with the problem of hermeneutics, the phenomenon of understanding and of the correct interpretation of what has been understood is not a problem specific to the methodology of the human sciences alone. There has long been a theological and a legal hermeneutics which were not so much theoretical as corollary and ancillary to the practical activity of the judge or clergyman who had completed his theoretical training. Even from its historical beginnings, the problem of hermeneutics goes beyond the limits of the concept of method as set by modern science. The understanding and the interpretation of texts is not merely a concern of science, but obviously belongs to human experience of the world in general. The hermeneutic phenomenon is basically not a problem of method at all. It is not concerned with a method of understanding by means of which texts are subjected to scientific investigation, like all other objects of experience. It is not concerned primarily with amassing verified knowledge such as would satisfy the methodological ideal of science. Yet it too is concerned with knowledge and with the truth. In understanding tradition, not only are texts understood, but insights are acquired and truths known. But what kind of knowledge and what kind of truth? By the way, this book was written, if I remember, uh, in the 1970s and in the beginning of the 1980s. It essentially talks about texts, and Hans-Georg Gadamer refers to texts. But as I will be going through that book, in this video and other videos, please remember that we are living in the times of overwhelming content. You can look at a Twitter feed or at a news feed online or at your main screen of YouTube you can look it at if you were looking at a text. So everything that Gadamer writes about texts and about understanding written human knowledge is just as pertinent to online internet content as, to, as it was pertinent to ordinary books. Okay, let's go on. Given the dominance of modern science in the philosophical elucidation and justification of the concept of knowledge and the concept of truth, this question does not appear legitimate, yet it is unavoidable even within the sciences. The phenomenon of understanding not only pervades all human relations to the world, it also has an independent validity within science. Uh, and it resists any attempt to reinterpret it in terms of scientific method. Yes, it is precisely what I was referring to in the case of that reading from Laplace and that reading from Fernand Braudel. Truth is one thing, 
understanding is another thing and knowledge is still another thing. If there is something or such thing as truth, we can only apprehend that truth by the intermediary of our understanding. So, if hermeneutics are to be considered as a philosophy of understanding, it is capital to understanding science and to understanding our own intellectual stance, for example, vis-à-vis -vis a Twitter feed which we get engaged in. The following investigations start with the resistance in modern science itself to the universal claim of scientific method. They are concerned to seek the experience of truth that transcends the domain of scientific method, wherever that experience is to be found, and to inquire into its legitimacy. Hence, the human sciences are connected to modes of experience that lie outside science, with the experiences of philosophy, of art, and of history itself. These are all modes of experience in which a truth is communicated that cannot be verified by the methodological means proper to science. Now it is a, a, a really a deep subject, a subject on which I work very much scientifically uh, when I bring up the issue of using artificial neural networks in social sciences, because my little intellectual obsession is the concept of collective intelligence. And uh, in that view, there is that big question, when we humans experience reality, do we experience the truth of reality or do we experience just some sort of interface that we make by ourselves and we make that interface in order to have some payoffs, to have some benefits and satisfaction from the environment. So there, there is a big question, can we experience at all the truth of reality? Contemporary philosophy is well aware of this, but it is quite a different question how far the truth claim of such modes of experience outside science can be philosophically estimated. The current interest in the hermeneutic phenomenon rests, I think, on the fact that only a deeper investigation of the phenomenon of understanding can provide this legitimation. This conviction is strongly supported by the importance that contemporary philosophy attaches to the history of philosophy. In regard to the historical tradition of philosophy, understanding occurs to us as a superior experience, enabling us easily to see through the illusion of historical method characteristics of, characteristic of research in the history of philosophy. It is part of the elementary experience of philosophy that when we try to understand the classics, of philosophical thought, they of themselves make a claim to truth that the consciousness or lay of later times can neither reject nor transcend. The naive self-esteem of the present moment may rebel against the idea that philosophical consciousness admits the possibility that one's own philosophical insight may be inferior to that of Plato or Aristotle, Leibniz, Kant or Hegel. One might think it a weakness that contemporary philosophy tries to interpret and assimilate its classical heritage with this acknowledgement of its own weakness. But it is undoubtedly a far greater weakness for philosophical thinking not to face such self-examination but to play at being faust. It is clear that in understanding the texts of these great thinkers, a truth is known that could not be attained in any other way. Even if this contradicts the yardstick of research and progress by which science measures itself. Okay, so here we have the perfect intellectual shitstorm. From that first piece of reading by Fernand Brodel, we know that a social thinker, a social scientist, essentially in the beginning always contemplates a diversity of social phenomena or something that he or she perceives as diversity of distinct social phenomena. Then we jump to Laplace and Laplace, and Laplace says, there are two points of view, the point of view of a perfect external intelligence, which sees everything in the same time. And there is the point of view of a human being, which sees essentially social reality from the inside. And it is a very limited view.
And now we have Hans Georg Gadamer who says, in that context, it is very useful to study not only those two points of view, so the point of view of the perfect of the perfect intelligence and the point of view of the human intelligence, but it is also useful to study the way that one translates into the other. So it is useful to uh, study the phenomenon of understanding as such. Okay, let's with those philosophical basics. Let's jump back to Fernand Brodel. So Professor Gadamer res will respectfully leave and we go back to Professor Braudel. Okay. In this second volume, I have tried to analyze the machinery of exchange as a whole, from primitive barter up to and including the most sophisticated capitalism. Starting from as careful and neutral description as possible, I have tried to grasp regularities and mechanisms, to write a sort of general economic history, as we have general principles of geography, or to use a different set of terms to construct a typology, a model or perhaps a grammar which will help up us at least to pin down the meaning of certain key words or of certain evident realities without, whoever, without however assuming that the general history can be totally rigorous, the typology definitive or at all complete, the model in any sense mathematically verifiable, or that the grammar can give us the key to an economic language or form of discourse. Even supposing that one such exists or is sufficiently consistent through time and space. In some, what follows is an attempt at intelligibility, at uncovering certain articulations and developments, and no less the powerful forces which have maintained the traditional order, inert violence, as Jean-Paul Sartre called it. it. This, then, is a study on the borderlines of the social, the political and the economic. So, as you can see, Professor Fernand Brodel essentially says more or less the same thing uh, that was sort of echoing in the writings of Hans Georg Gadamer. When, when we study something complex, like this complex social reality of the world many centuries ago, we need to advance step by step to be sort of careful not to jump on the first idea or the first impression that comes to our mind. Because, for example, when we... I know it by experience, because uh, I have a little bit of interest in studying the European uh, economic history of the 17th century. And uh, what I know that it is very tempting to consider those people at the end or in the second half of the 17th century as primitive in comparison to us. But it is very misleading. Those people were very fine thinkers and very fine uh, business people too. Huh? Uh, as I read some books or some pieces of writing, some letters from the epoch, from the 17th century, I come to the conclusion that these guys were really sharp. Maybe in some respects they were sharper than we are today. Uh, and uh, Professor Brodel like, strongly focuses on the fact that we must advance step by step. Be careful and sort of uh, Occam razor oriented in our apprehension of an economic history. Okay, that would be all in that very loose train of thoughts in the philosophy of social science.